presenter is uh, Ido Rosenzweig. Uh, he's the director of the Cyber Belligerencies and Terrorism Research at the Minerva Center for the Study of Law Under Extreme Conditions. Uh, he's also worked as a researcher at the Israel Democracy Institute, uh, served in the International Law Department of the Israeli Foreign Ministry, uh, and uh, by chance is an experienced computer programmer. Over to you. I'm not sure about writing a PhD under <laughs> Yuval and I's supervision together. <laughs> yeah, not intimidating at all. Um, okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Tamar, thank you for the invitation. And Lily is not here, so I will thank her tomorrow. Um, my presentation is actually based on two, two elements. One is a very long research that has been done in the Minerva Center with regard to cyber and regulation. And the other one is my interest in international law. Now, I should note that this paper and this presentation has been written both by uh, Professor Alman Reichmann and myself. And we worked together on it. And you might be able to see during the presentation some elements of both my approach, which is more international law oriented, and uh, Amnon's approach, which is more uh, regulation of the law uh, oriented. And together we try to find our um, common way to provide each one a cent into our two cents into this field of discussion. So our presentation, and I'm going to even buy you some time, I think, when I'm done. Um, Everyone says that, let's see. Yeah. I think. <coughs> Um, is related to a lot of things that have been addressed in a certain way, but what happens when a state is hacking extraterritorially? What happens when a state is acting uh, cyber-wise outside of its territory, outside of its uh, uh, jurisdiction in a, in a regular way, in the physical way? Do we have application of human rights over uh, such hackings, or, do, or don't we? Um, the, the question is not in, in the void. The, not, the question is related because we know that state-operated hackings is taking place basically on a daily basis. I think we can all thank Snowden for putting a lot of light on that. We know exactly uh, what, at least he claims that he's taking place and he's shown that he's taking place. However, while this kind of hacking by states can take both internally and extraterritorially, we do assume, we do work under the premise that when the state is work, uh, operating internally, international human rights law is applicable. But it's not that clear with regard to extraterritorial approach, extraterritorial activity. And if we look, for example, at the Tan Talent uh, 2.0 manual, we can see that there is a big disagreement. I'm not sure if it's a big one, but there was a disagreement on the application of international human rights law on extraterritorial uh, activity. And there wasn't a, a majority opinion, it's going to be a, was a minority opinion. I, mean, I have no idea where Mike was on, on that issue. We might later on find out. The correct opinion. The correct opinion. So my opinion. Um, <laughs> and and w we're going to approach both of the, uh, these opinions. But I'm going to start with our main premise. Our main premise is when a state is hacking, when it gets control either of data or a computer or something or communication, it gains some level of control. There is some control over the data or the, or the computer. And therefore, there is a question regarding the application and the, the applicability of international human rights law. Now, the importance of, of online available data is, well, in this room is the least uh, significant issue of topic. Uh, there is corp correspondence, there are photos, videos, Internet of Things has been raised up in, in this uh, um, uh, conference. And it's uh, almost everything we do, everything we relate to um, is online related. There is data about it, there is communication about it. And it is very important to know whether or not state activity with regard to it should be under the, the, the framework of international human rights law. Now, access to this kind of information can be gaining various methods where we can think about targeting specific computers, we can think about targeting communication. 
it's like getting full control of a computer or, or partial control of a computer or data, getting listening to communication being transferred. Um, we can monitor data. We can uh, search for buzzwords like uh, a terrorist or jihad or Donald Trump. And we can do manipulation of data. There are many ways to do it. They can be short-term. They can be long-term. There are many ways of, of getting in access to information. But in our view, each and every one of these methods is based on the fact that in order to get, in order to do it, you have to have at least a minimal level of control either over the computer or the communication or the data that is being searched for or gained or, or collected. Now, we believe that once you have that kind of control, the discussion of applicability of international human rights law becomes very relevant. And I'm not going to get into a whole uh, uh, basic introduction to international human rights law and ICCPR, but I would say that um, what we are referring to mainly is the first generation of, of human rights, which is mainly ICCPR and mostly the cyber-related rights uh, that are appear in, in, in that framework. Now, having that been the introduction of what I'm going to talk about, I will do a small explanation of what I'm not going to talk about, what the research is not about. We are not talking about non-state activity with regard to hacking or gaining control, unless I put a caveat on if you can do an attribution of that non-state activity to a state. We are not talking about internal state activity, which I said is clearly uh, under the framework of international human rights law. And we are not talking about, which um, I heard uh, an earlier example about physical control over a person. If I'm going to hold Noam and ask him for your Facebook uh, uh, password, this is not within that framework of what we're talking about. What we're talking about is extraterritorial control over computers or data or communication, pure cyber discussion. Now, <coughs> The, the application of all the first generation rights within the cyber world has to be adopted. It has to be manipulated, it has to be adjusted in order to apply to a, a non-physical, non-territorial uh, world. And with regard, the question is, if you have a control by the state, <coughs> what is the relevant level of control that is sufficient to invoke international human rights law? And if it does, what are we talking about the responsibility to respect <coughs> and protect with regard to um, well, with the state, the hacking state? And remember, I'm not talking about the territorial state. I'm not talking about the jurisdictional state. I'm talking about the hacking state. Now, the original premises that we are trying to correspond with is the Tallinn 2.0, where they say, clearly, international and human rights law is applicable online just as well. But with regard to extraterritorial application, as I said, there was a majority opinion and minority opinion. The majority opinion said there is a need for a physical or territorial control, and there is no virtual control with regard to application of international human rights law. The minority opinion, on the other hand, said, if someone is going to be affected, someone's rights are going to be affected from this uh, uh, use, this control, this uh, manipulation of data, then there is application of extraterritorial, uh, there is extraterritorial application of the international human rights law. Now, we agree with the minority opinion here for two reasons. One, um, extraterritorial control over data is neither new nor unique to cyber operations. Such unique interpretation, arguing that this is a unique situation, would actually uh, lead to what we uh, fondly call, it's clearly not our uh, uh, branding, the law of the horse. Law of the horse meaning that you have a new kind of regulation related to very uh, esoteric topic, like what happens if a horse kicks you is it different than if no one's going to kick me for being too late on time? Um, are we talking about when you're selling a horse? Is it different than selling a car or something like that? And, and the general approach is no. 
horse is not something unique and therefore there is no need for a new set of rules just for a horse. And if you're saying that the mere fact that extraterritorial control over data is unique on its own, then you're getting into that framework of just setting a new framework of law where it's not needed. <coughs> the second uh, reason that we agree with the minority opinion is that reducing international human, human rights law application to, <coughs> to, not, not, to be, uh, not be applicable to extraterritorial uh, approach would actually encourage state to use cyber infringement of human rights. There is this very clear slippery slope here. So if we look at the approach that says, are we talking about something unique or not looking at something unique? Or as I said, are we looking at the law of the horse or not looking at the law of the horse? We need to think what is unique about cyber operations. And I was told that I'm going to be, uh, the presentation is going to be much later hour. So uh, in light of the uh, cat photos, I was thinking uh, our approach is actually to add some color, color, colorful uh, images to our presentation as well. So I put aside the horse that if I had a slide, you would, you would have seen a horse. Um, our test for uniqueness of cyber is what we refer to as the James Bond rule. Can James Bond do it? Then it's not unique. If James Bond is able, and James Bond is able to anyone, and was asked, uh, I think well, it was two weeks ago, which James Bond am I referring to? And clearly there is only one James Bond, and, and yeah, you all know who it is. Um, <laughs> okay, so if James Bond can do it, it's not unique. There is no need to regulate it on its own. If James Bond can do it, cannot do it, then we are talking about something unique and can consider some kind of a, a, a new regulation, relevant regulation. Now, what's unique about cyber? What's unique about hacking in cyber? I would say one main thing, the magnitude, the ability to get a huge amount of data Regular, even if it's for one computer or, or a large amount of computer, a large amount of people get that magnitude is what makes cyber hacking unique. And this is where we need to think whether or not it should be regulate, regulate as something special or not. Now, our approach is that regardless of your answer to the James Bond rule, international human rights law should apply. It should apply on two elements. If you accept the, the law of the horse approach, which means there is no need for cyber unique uh, uh, legislation, then we are in within the regular framework where international human rights law applies. However, if we reject that notion and, and say that there is a need for cyber unique uh, regulation, then we are within the framework of Lex Specialis and I think uh, Yuval, in, in one of your articles, you, you called Lex Cyber, Cyber Radical or something like that? Uh, Cybernetic. Yeah. And, and, and even if we have that Lex something, um, still international human rights law should apply. It should apply just like we do it with any other framework of law, any other Lex Speciali framework of law. And the most given one is international, international humanitarian law, the laws of war. Human rights are still applicable when you are dealing with the laws of war. And there's only a question of what are the relations between these two bodies of law when there is a contradiction between them, when there is a clash between them. And I doubt how much clash we're going to find between the Lex Cyber and uh, international human rights law. So it's not about the applicability, it's about the level of control that a state might have extraterritorially. How am I doing? Two minutes. Two minutes, good. You see, I told you I'll be, no. Uh, no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> so how should we determine the level of control? We, pref we suggest two tests. One is, talks about the minimum level of control and the other one um, relates about the implication. The minimum level can be looked at 
several options, several uh, uh, frameworks, but we suggest to look at three frameworks of uh, operation. One of them is data collection, which can be reduced to two. One is the look for buzzwords, and the other one is to look for a specific uh, uh, group of people. And the second one, data collection has two options, and the second one is actually have control over a computer. One might think that getting control over a computer seems to be having more control over uh, uh, the person, and therefore more uh, application of human rights law. But we actually argue that even if the data search, you can gain enough control because data search is user sensitive. I can look for political information. I can look for sexual orientation. I can look for uh, nude photos of celebrities. I can look for uh, uh, medical information of people. So the user sensitive here makes it as important as uh, control over computer. And therefore, we suggest two tests of cyber control that will allow us to know when a state has enough control over uh, 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 data information or computer, which one is uh, uh, control as penetration, the ability to control and command a certain uh, uh, machine, or control as the collection of data, the ability to collect data. The more I am able to collect data, the more control I have. And I will shortly address the implications of having such a control with regard to application of international human rights law. And we'll say with two caveats and then one short address to respect, one short address to protect. When with that, I'm done. Uh, with regard to the uh, implication, there are two caveats. Uh, no human rights, your, no human right is absolute. And when no human right is absolute, clearly not every violation or every infringement of any human right is something that is prohibited. <laughs> There are ways to regulate that. There are a lot of uh, testing and there are a lot of uh, um, um, legal tests on how to uh, decide whether or not the, the violation is uh, severe or, or <coughs> illegal. And the second one is that the illegality of the operation should not affect the application of human rights to the situation. OK, so with regard to respect, of human rights, which shall uh, provide negative responsibility over the state. We suggest that um, when collecting data, the, the state should regulate its hacking process to make sure that it doesn't uh, collect useless or, or non-required information or sensitive information that there is no need for, uh, for it. And on top of that, use as, as to the best ability it can advanced algorithms in order to put the men further in the chain. As much as you can put the men further in the chain, if you just do an algorithm that goes over the data and analyze what you need in order for, for the operatively, then you don't have to do a, a severe breaching of the human rights. And with regard to protection of human rights, the positive responsibilities of the state, <coughs> one is to prevent exposure once it got oversensitive data or misuse of data. And recently, well, not recently, Snowden talked about the fact that NSA employees are exchanging nude photos they found in their searches between the employees to, to, to uh, of make sure that there, there is no such misuse or, or, or uh, abuse of the information is one thing, but also delete unnecessary data. And I will end um, with one question that um, if we get enough control over computer or information, one could argue that could lead to two elements. One is what happens if I have enough control? Do I have an obligation as a state to make sure that that information, that private information, that sensitive information is safe from others? And what happens if I find non-related information to what I'm looking for, not security, not nothing, but chat, chat pornography on that computer? Do I have an obligation to stop its uh, distribution? Do I have an obligation? Remember, I'm operating extraterritorial hacking. Do I have an obligation to go to the authorities or find a way to, to protect the rights of the child that our photos are there? Um, I'm not sure about that, but with that, I'm going to conclude. Thank you. Are we coming here? Yeah, maybe if the... Uh,